Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast number 830. It is now time where we reach out to you, the Nerdist community, for the Nerdist Community Corkboard, starring Katie Levine. Yes. So this one is from Kate Lynn, and she says, I would like to promote our unique sporting club, the Southwest Sydney Unicycle Club. <gasps> Isn't that cool? I love this already. Southwest Sydney Unicycle Club? Southwest Sydney Unicycle Club. They're around... in Sydney, Australia? Yes. So the they... unicycles go the other way? They do. They The, mm-hmm. the wheels spin. The... Everyone yeah. goes backwards. Okay, it's weird. Good. Um, they have about 50 members. They love to ride unicycles, perform tricks, compete in the Australian Unicycle Hockey League. What? That sounds fucking amazing. I know. They have four uh, unicycle hockey teams that compete in the Australian League, and three are in the top four out of nine teams. They encourage all in Sydney um, area to come try something new, and and, uh, you can email them at swsunicycleclub at gmail.com, or you can find them on Instagram and Facebook by searching swsunicycleclub. I am so excited. That that was the one that you chose to share. I, I love it. <laughs> tried to learn how to ride a unicycle when I was in college. It's hard, right? It is hard, but then someone stole my unicycle. Who the fuck would steal a unicycle? That's what I said. Are there fucking clowns? Like, like what is that? I don't know. It was tell you know, some drunk person that's just like I you don't know, know, like in uh, like because I lived in an apartment at UCLA. Yeah, and. It was the parking lot was like a carport, and you know some of those storage units that are yeah. over the. Well, they got in and they. I had this unicycle in there, and they fucking took. That's the, bullshit. I know it's bullshit because I had almost learned how to ride it, and I was too broke to buy another one, so that was oh, it. Yeah, that's upsetting. Now I'm gonna buy all the <laughs> unicycles. You can you can start a unicycle hockey. I'm gonna go. That would start be. Uni- I feel like that's good. That would be so hard. Unicycle, unicycle hockey? Well, because it's hard enough just to get the balance, yeah. just to stay in one place. I, w- I wonder, I have to look them up and see if they have video. I want to, like, watch this. That is an incredible amount of core strength to be able to swing a hockey stick and knock, knock a puck while you're... Uh, <laughs> it would be even better if it was on ice. <laughs> I assume it's not on ice. No. I assume it's land hockey. I hope so. Uh, with this episode is Gail Ann Hurd, who is promoting Falling Water, which is uh, her new show that she's executive producing, which is uh, Thursday, October 13th at 10 p.m. on USA. Uh, Gail is a serious badass. Gail, uh, I know from Walking Dead, and we've never really had a conversation at length, and I've always wanted to because Gail is responsible for so many of the things that I loved, particularly when I was growing yeah. up. She has quite a resume. She is an incredible resume. She is an impressive human being. And I, I got to say, as a woman, too, I love, I love these interviews with these uh, really powerful women producers. They're great. Yeah. And They're very Ga- inspiring. Gail is, Gail is so inspiring. And when you – in some of the stories that she tells in here and also information, the things she you, – when you'll hear in a minute, but the things she says about – how the Terminator almost ended yeah. up was fucking mind blowing, and I don't know if I had known that before. That was crazy. But uh, <laughs> yes, I have all the respect in the world for Gail, and uh, it was really. I, this she came to my house to do this because it was a day off of that midnight, and we were doing house stuff, so she was kind enough to come out to the house. Uh, so please watch Falling Water and and Walking Dead when it comes back on yes. uh, October twenty third. And if you're going to be at uh, New York Comic Con this weekend, I will be there doing the Walking Dead panel. Oh, awesome! So I'll be there for that. And uh, this episode was brought to you by. Our pals, Those Who Can't, yeah, the show Those Who Can't on True TV premieres October 6th, which uh, I believe is today. Yeah, today, the yeah, day this comes out. Yeah, the day that out. this goes up. It's uh, Adam Caton Holland and Ben Roy and Andrew Overdahl and Maria Thayer, and uh, it's basically a... It's like a group of teachers, and they're, 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 it's, it's like a creator, actor, like they make the whole thing. It's amazing. Yeah, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's yeah. A, a, a handful of the guys from Grolix, and then Maria Thayer. Uh, Kyle Kinane, Rory Scovel. It's so many people that if you love comedy, you love Baron Vaughn, Will Sasso, yes. John Doerr, Ian Carmel, Sean Patton, Marilyn Rice Club, The Sklars. So uh, go watch it. Uh, now it is available. The uh, the showrunner EP is Dean Laurie, who was on Arrested Development. Yep. And, it's also uh, on Hulu. The first season's on Hulu, so you can catch up. Yes, and watch the new season on True TV. So uh, there you go. Those who can't, so happy for those guys. And I, I, I we got to get them back on the show. We haven't had them on at midnight in a while. Yeah. Uh, Gail Ann Hurd, episode 830 of the Nerdist Podcast. Katie, if you would be so kind. Now entering Nerdist.com.
Thanks for coming to the house. I'm, uh, uh, it's funny because we never, there are people that you work with and you're like, I only ever see you. It, like our hangouts are only just fits and bursts of like talking before Talking Dead or like talking at a Comic-Con or like a, d- a dinner afterwards, but we never actually get to hang out. I know because I have no social life. You have no, I, and I really don't have a social life either. I mean, because it's work life yeah. becomes your social life. And, um, and I, I honestly, I mean, Lindsay can tell you, I mean, I do absolutely nothing. <laughs> I mean, my life is so pathetic. Well, you do make a lot but, of good stuff. But that's though. okay. You know, <laughs> I, you know what I grew up and, you know, in the seventies and eighties, I mean, if you were going to go party, that would have been the it time. It like is kind of lame now. Yeah. It's like you go to a party and you go, that's not how we did it in the seventies and the eighties. <laughs> oh my God. We're the worst. We went to a, we went to a. Uh, a guy that was playing at Largo the other night and by uh, like 11 o'clock we were like oh it's 11 you know like we were just ready to exactly because I'm thinking when I worked for Roger Corman there was like this this um, punk like underground club on North El Centro that was walking distance from the editing room I mean like serious punk yeah and um, and we'd go there until like three in the morning, go home, you know, wash up and be, you know, back at work at eight in the morning. Oh, my God. I mean, like God. every day. And we were working for Roger Corman seven days a week. <laughs> and, and so I'm thinking, you know what, that I'm paying the price for for that. Did you want to go into film? Like, was, was film a thing that you always set out to do? Or did you just sort of, ah, I'm going to take this job working for Corman for a summer and see what happens. And then that was it. No, because actually, when I was a junior in college, I was an economics major, and I happened to attend Stanford in Britain, and there was an intensive program in British film and broadcasting, and I thought, you can get a degree in this? Oh, wow. You can pursue this as a profession? It was completely eye-opening. And I was really lucky because the professor who then became my mentor and my advisor in communications was the only person at Stanford at the time who'd worked in the business. Um, Julian Blaustein, who'd produced the original Day the Earth Stood Still. Oh, wow. And Broken Arrow and Storm Center. And so he became an advocate. And my another professor of mine, Stephen Kovacs, went to work for Roger Corman as his head of production and recruited me to come work. That's incredible. So it literally was, I had no idea. I would never have known on my own how to start pursuing a career in film and television. I was literally, I was recruited. I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm an, I'm an athlete, (laughs) you know, I I didn't get a signing bonus. I think I I paid a signing. Sure. Of course. (laughs) And probably paid in a lot of like human hours uh, of your life. Yes. Did you know who Roger Corman was? No, no, you didn't. And remember this was before internet. It's not like you could Google him. Right. Um, but you know, I, I gradually and vaguely remembered that I'd gone to see films he'd directed at drive-ins, double bills, especially the, the Poe films. Yeah. You know, The Pit and the Pendulum and the, you know, the Tomb of Lai and things like that. Um, so I, I really knew him more as a director than a, than a producer, but I had seen Piranha. I mean, I can't think of anyone else. I don't know who the analogous, per- I guess it's just so different now, but a guy that's so... It's he's so interesting because, on the one hand, he's revered, but on the other hand, it's also like, well, it's a Corman movie. It's kind of silly, you know. It's like they're, the, but he's still so respected. But, but at the look same at this. Time. I mean, you know, I, I have to say, I mean, with Curtis Hansen having passed away, someone I loved and adored as not only a person but a director. His first film was for Roger Corman. I'd totally forgotten that. <laughs> I mean, it's Jim Cameron, it's Ron Howard, Francis Ford Coppola, Martin Scorsese, um, Jonathan Demme. They all made their first films for Roger. <laughs> so who has a track record like that? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody. You can't imagine American film without the people that Roger discovered. Did he ever get some? Did he ever get like a lifetime? He did. He did. Oh, okay, he got great. he got a, an Oscar. Great. Um, at the Governor's Awards. That's nice. And we all showed up for him. And uh, and I think actually Quentin Tarantino is the one who, um, you know, who, who gave most of the remarks. And I think that um, I think Ron Howard actually gave him the award. That's incredible. And what what do you what was it specifically about him that made him work? Like what what was his kind of guiding principle, or what did you what did you learn from him? Well, with with Roger, first of all, 
this you gotta remember when I went to work for him it was nineteen seventy eight. Okay. There were no real role models for women as producers back then. I mean, women weren't running studios, they weren't show running <laughs> T V series, you know. Um and um so I I thought I would be a career executive secretary. Oh wow. I mean, honestly, I mean that that's kind of what you thought. I mean, I'm in the industry. Isn't this amazing? Um and Roger was the one who in my very first interview with him said so what kind of career path do you want to follow? Oh, wow. I, I was like, I thought he was going to ask me, which really dates me, um, you know, how, f how quickly I took shorthand. Right. Um, and how fast I could type. And instead he says, you know, what do you want to do? I, and I, I thought, you know, okay, I've got a degree in economics. Um, and Roger's a producer. And I, I said, I, I want to produce. He said, great. Okay, this is the place for you. So he actually had a career in mind bef for me before I did. What is it? What do you think he saw? Like, what do you think it was that he saw in you? Well, women work for less. <laughs> they, <laughs> oh, no. they work harder. Uh, and, and, you know, he, he, he knew I was smart because I had graduated top of my class in, um, in communications at Stanford. And um, so, you know, so he figured I, I had the smart thing going on. Right. Um, and I clearly was capable of carrying on enough of a conversation that he thought that perhaps I could communicate some ideas to people. And then I think beyond that, he felt he could train me and he did. What did he train? What is, I mean, the idea of the, producing is such a weird word because it can mean so many different things. I tend to think of it as a person who can solve a problem, any problem on a set. The oh, producer that's it. is, that is just the problem solver. Yes. Yes, I mean, you are the cheerleader, you are the fairy godmother, um, you're also, um, you know, oftentimes the, the, the very stern, pro, you know, proctor, right. who's walking around noticing if anyone's out of line, um, and, and you have to lay down the rules. I, I think one of the reasons that the Walking Dead has continued to this point is from the very beginning, Frank Darabont and I made a pact that we would not hire any assholes. <laughs> we had a no asshole policy. And so agents and managers would pitch us actors or directors and, you know, we'd, we'd check them out. And we honestly, and we still do to this day, we check people out. And, uh, and if you're an asshole, you're not going to be on The Walking Dead. Or if you are, you, you won't last long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing about the show is that you know that, I mean, it, it, the j job security on Walking Dead is, is fairly non-existent cause at, any, at any time. And just when you think... Oh, well, I'm a character that everyone loves. Like, that's when you should start getting nervous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you all of a sudden read, wow, that is fantastic. We're really, we're really digging down deep into who this person is. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you may be having a dead dinner soon thereafter. <laughs> well, yeah, because it, I mean, I talked about this when Kirkman was on, but, you know, people, obviously there were some there there were people who were unhappy with not knowing who Negan killed at the end of last season and they were very vocal and they were frustrated and you know cuz they they wanted a completion on that but i have to tell you all summer long it's been so fun to have people go who was it and and i'll go well i think it was maybe this person but i haven't seen it yet you must know. No, I really don't know. Well, I think it's this person. Well, why would it be that person? Because he wouldn't do that. And, and it's fostered so much conversation within the community of fans that come up to me that I, I actually, it's been really fun. It's been really fun to talk about it because I feel like television is losing, with the exception of a few shows, people binge watch stuff so much that there's just no conversation around the because binging there, when you're There's done. no water cooler anymore. No, really. not at all. But yes, you're right. I mean, I, I, there has never been such interest and, um, you know, passion, both negative, how could you do this to us? And I can't wait to find out as, you know, from this, this cliffhanger. And, and by the way, you know, let's also think about what a fantastic introduction to Negan it was. Yeah. I mean, Jeffrey Dean Morgan just killed it. I mean, it's sad that he has to kill someone along with it, but he absolutely kills. Yeah, that it is all. crazy. Where wait, you know, people keep saying like, 
Are you reti- are you excited for Walking Dead to come back on the twenty third? I'm like, I am, but I also know that something terrible is. G- I mean, I also know it's going to be like someone's going to die. It's 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 kind of weird to say. Yeah, I'm excited to see who's dead. You know, like which character that I have grown attached to is no longer going to be there. I had I had pitched this idea of like, oh, just make it some random Alexandrian that we've never heard anymore, <laughs> like Greg or Gary or someone. We're like, oh, it was Gary, you know. But I know it's going to be someone. I know it's going to be someone that we that we and, love. And you will be our grief counselor. <laughs> I will. Which is a lot of pressure. Who's my grief counselor? No one's my grief counselor. <laughs> I just I'm going to watch it a day early. Yes. And now I guess by the time this goes up, now we can talk about this. But the the Hollywood Forever thing is going to be incredible because we you know we did the finale for breaking bad there but i think this is well we gonna... know, we know we did we've done a premiere you did a premiere we did a we did a a walking dead premiere there yep way back in the day really was that yes. that must have predated is that predated that me must have predated might you. have predated me it's kind of funny when my show started i feel like the cast and everyone was a little leery of it because like what is this because there wasn't a thing yet no what is this what do they want why do they and, so, and by the way, if it hadn't been you, it could have been so cheesy. I appreciate that. We are so lucky <laughs> because I'm sure you've watched some of the ones that people have I mean, been launching yeah, for other you know, shows, I, yeah, and I, they're cheesy. <laughs> well, I don't mean you know I I'm gonna stammer until I trail off, but I but I I've, I've been very excited to because I really do feel like this you know this weird cousin. And so I root for the show and I'm protective of the show and the people on it because I care I care about them. And so it is weird to feel like you know one of those people, you know one of those people is going to go away and then after that it'll be someone else and then but I get really protective if people you know if they if they get aggro about something that happens on the show, I get protective like it's like I'm like I like I work on it. But and you do. I I do in a way. But uh, but it, it's just been such an incredible experience. I mean, and I think everyone understands that this just doesn't happen very often, particularly today in no. today's television no. landscape. And, and not only that, it, it, going back to the Walking Dead family, it really, once you're a part of this family, we do not let you go. <laughs> um, you know, j- just the other day, um, well, two nights ago, Lindsay and I um, actually had a, at a falling water event, and Scott Wilson and his wife Heavenly were there. Oh, they're so wonderful! And, and and you know, and I'm now on Twitter promoting Chad Coleman's new show. I mean, you know, we we just you never get beyond you know the, our our care, our love, our support, and and I think you can tell that. I mean, the first person actually to promote falling water was John Bernthal. Oh, that's so Shane. nice. And it was like, you got to see this show. It's going to be fantastic. I mean, you know what? You actually, I mean, people may think differently, but you cannot pay people to do that. No. It no. is It is because of their love and their passion and the fact that, that we really do have something special beyond just a job. Well, and also it was a sort of a forced community in the sense of you're shooting in rural Georgia. Everyone's just there. There's nothing else to do there. But hang out with each other, like to be with each other and to support each other. And it's such an emotional, I mean, I, when I look at a show like that, I'm like, wow, people just spend most of the time either fighting or crying or screaming or running, you know, like it, <laughs> there's, a, there are very few like upbeat feel good episodes of the show where everything's okay, you yeah, know? Yeah, and, and the, the conditions, the heat, the humidity, the conditions, the fact that, you know, people are working 12 to 14 hours a day. From we start shooting the beginning of May, we end right before Thanksgiving, and and really, it's it's a community, it's a community effort, and there's no difference between you know a day player who comes in as a production assistant or an extra playing a zombie, and Andy Lincoln. I mean, we are all equal, and everyone cares as much about each other as you know as you could possibly imagine. And and I really do attribute it in in good measure to to Andy and and his attitude. You could not have a better number one on the call sheet than Andy Lincoln. I, you know that's that's one of the most important things in a production. If your number one on the call sheet is cool, 
that sets a cool vibe. If your number one is kind of a dick, that sets a bad a bad vibe that ripples throughout the rest of the production. It's, it's very funny. I mean, you'll see someone come in as a guest star. And they're used to, you know, having been a guest star on a lot of TV shows in, you know, and they're like their later seasons. <laughs> right, right, right. We're in our later seasons. <laughs> um, and they won't know their lines. And uh, honestly, Andy is such an actor. He's such a thespian. Um, you know, Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. I mean, it's the best of the best in, in the UK. And, uh, and he literally will assume the person has some sort of affliction. <laughs> right. And it'll go to them and say, you know, I'm really sorry about, you know, that are you having trouble with your lines? I'll, I'll run them with you over lunch. You know, I'll meet you after work. And let me tell you, no one comes in after lunch or the next day without being completely off book and prepared. Uh, and, you know, and he invites everyone to join him for lunch at his table. You know, which is, by the way, not like a little small table. It's in the it's in the catering tent with the rest of us. But, but you know, you don't get that. You really get the people who are surrounded by their posse and, you know, and don't make eye contact with anyone else. That is not Andy or anyone else on the show. How, I'm, I mean, obviously this is not an official question, but how long do you think Walking Dead could go? I mean, do you feel like it could go indefinitely or do you think like uh, at a certain you know, point I, I can't even think of that um from from what i've heard uh you know someone at the network has basically said it, it can go forever <laughs> you know I, I think it those of us on the creative side we have to focus on we're going to make season seven the best season ever of the walking dead and we got to just keep our eye on the ball which is right in front of us and not start thinking you know how do we get there i think sure. we we just have to get through one great season after another. And as long as we do that, we'll continue to go and the cast will continue to want to show up and bring these roles to life. I'm very pleased that there is a Shiva. I, it was just not something I ever thought. I mean, you remember like two seasons ago, I was saying, Rob, like, how the fuck are you going to get a tiger on the... And he was like, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like I just write a bunch of shit they could never do on the television show. I and- know. Even Robert <laughs> was like, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't think we're going to have any... I don't think we're going to have any real tigers. And the truth is, we don't have a real tiger, but we have a real tiger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then is there going to be a separate... Just because the nature of Negan is that the word "fuck" is every second word out of his mouth. Is there going to be a? Is there going to be like a a home video, a home oh, yeah. version? Oh of- yeah, we record both. Oh good. Oh, oh that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> oh yeah. Yes, we do. We do those takes for the for the. Uh- for the DVD, you couldn't even Blu-ray. bleep him because it would just be like it would just sound like an emergency broadcast test. It, it would, it, it, it would, and uh, you know, and <laughs> it, it just means that poor Jeffrey Dean Morgan, who's literally got you know each each episode, he'll have twelve pages of monologues, <laughs> has to do all of them twice. Yeah, Negan likes to talk. He is he's a talker, but it going. I want to go back, coming out of Corman. Just because, I mean, I know people know that you've produced a lot of amazing stuff, but I want to I wanna just read through the list so that people really understand the impact. Just how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> just how long I've been doing this. No, I feel like that. I feel, I, just, I was just thinking about the other day about like how long, you know, someone asked me how long I've been into stand-up and I was like, well, I started, I mean... My first, when I watched Steve Martin on SNL and I started buying my first Steve Martin records, you know, since the mid-70s, and I was like, wow, that really sounds like a long time ago. It, it's a long time ago. <laughs> but the good news is we're still here and we're still making stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you at, at Comic-Con in San Diego this year, we had the 30th anniversary of the release of Aliens. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's nuts. Yes. Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, we, you know, here we are in Hall H... You know, the, 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 all the principal cast showed up. And, you know, Jim Sigourney, myself, um, Bill Paxton and Lance Henriksen, um, you know, um, Jeanette Goldstein was there. You, you name it. Um, and Paul Reiser. Oh, that's right. Yes. Of course. Paul Reiser. Carter Burke. <laughs> and, and Carrie Henn, who's all grown up, who played, who played, um, who played Newt. Um, and... And it was amazing. So, you know, here we have Hall H. And then we went to a screening because they there, there was a, a the, Jim actually recolor timed it and, you know, got a great digital version. And they 
they played it in San Diego. And we, we asked how many people here had seen the, the film before in a theater. Almost all the hands went up. And I said, well, how many of you were actually born when the movie came out? And there were only about a tenth of the people. They'd, st they'd seen it at a revival. Oh, that's great. Of the, of the film. And uh, it, it blew us away. I mean, it, was, it, was, it really was such a different time. I mean, this is going to sound like an old person talking, but it was such a different time for film because going to a movie really was an event. And now it just sort of feels like, ah, I'll just see that. You know, it's like it's everything. Entertainment's just become so accessible and kind of disposable in a way. But those, those movies, the scope of them, I mean, I, I saw all of them in the theater and I saw Terminator in the theater, even though I pretty sure I was too young to see Terminator in the theater. But that movie captured just that, it just, at the perfect, the timing of it was flawless. Like, just coming out of the 70s, just when technology is starting to become a real consumer. Like by, by the way, how hilarious is it that only last year did Stephen Hawking and that whole group say, we better be careful because the machines <laughs> might wipe us out? It's like, where were you in 1984? You could have gone to see The Terminator. <laughs> and you probably could have come to that conclusion a lot sooner than 2015. Well, we always joke about it, you know, of the uh, the impending robot uprising. Uh, I mean, it's it's funny. You've worked on a lot of things where something wipes everyone out, yeah, whether it's yeah. robots or aliens or zombies. Yeah, well, you know what? The stakes are life and death stakes. You can't get better than the apocalypse for life and death stakes. So with Terminator, what, I mean, when did you... Were you there from the very beginning, the very beginning of the process, the the, the inception? I co-wrote it. Right, but was was it your? Was it who came? <laughs> it was came, Jim's idea. It was Jim's idea. Yeah. And did he just say one day, "Hey, I have this idea about a robot revolution," and a guy goes back in time and he? Was, how does he present Terminator to you for the first time? Well, the first time we met, he was uh, he was building models on uh, Roger Corman's space epic Battle Beyond the Stars, mm -hmm. which was how hilarious his remake of of um akira kurosawa seven samurai now we have magnificent seven remake recently um and uh and you know he ended up partially due to my help um as the art director so he went from building spaceship models to the art director and that and and i was helping even though as the assistant production manager i was helping to paint sets and do everything that needed to be done so we could shoot the next day and we had a lot of time to talk so he that was when he first pitched me the initial idea for the abyss. Oh my God! Was was uh, and this is like in um, you know like nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty, and uh, and he then his his the first film that he directed was Piranha Two: The Spawning, mm -hmm. saltwater piranha that fly. Yep. Is well, it? you got up the stakes. <laughs> yeah. You know? And uh, he was in Italy editing the film. Or should I say breaking into the editing room because the Italian producer had taken it over. <laughs> Shit. But he was using his credit card to break into the <laughs> editing room. We edited on film back then and he would re-splice the film back the way he wanted it. It was very funny. But he, he was sick and he called me and said, I had this fever dream. And in the fever dream, um, I saw this metal endoskeleton, anodized metal, um, emerging from the flames. And I think that's a seminal image. I'm not quite sure what the story is yet, but clearly it, it's a cyborg. And, uh, and the story started there. And, and I mean, it really, I mean, everything went into it. It's like, okay, it's going to be our first film. Um, we have to be able to afford to make it, so it has to be present day. We can't have the whole thing in the future. Right. So that's, what, that's where we got the idea of it being time travel. I mean, all of these things came from that central image and then reality. Holy shit. The, the funniest thing to me about that was seeing the difference between Schwarzenegger in Hercules in New York, which is hilarious because they've dubbed his voice the entire movie, and you even kind of solve the problem of his, at that point, his English not being great because he just doesn't talk that much. In the and, and by the way, we didn't change the script for him. It was always that way. Um, although initially he was suggested to play the role that Michael Bean played, 
which would have been a little more uh, difficult because he has all of the exposition. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so, but, but Arnold is the one who said, I want to play the title role. It's not, you know, it's, it's not called Kyle Reese. It's called the Terminator. <laughs> well, you know, what was great about it though, is that I feel like if, if you were cat, well, even in the Terminator reboot that he, he was buff. It's like, I like that Kyle was not like today's standard of like, oh, you got to, you know, like everyone's got to, you got to see their obliques and they have to oh, have yeah. like 12 oh, packs. Yeah. I mean, like Kai, Reese was in great, sh he was in good shape. He was right. a fighter, but it wasn't right. like, all right. He hadn't been working well, he, out. He didn't he, have P90X no. in the fucking, you know, no. in the, in the not too distant future. No. So I thought he, I can't imagine, I can't imagine if Schwarzenegger had been Reese. It just worked out so it, well, perfectly. Well, I mean, and this is not an apocryphal story. Uh, we were really told that O.J. Simpson should play the Terminator. And I am <laughs> honestly not joking. <laughs> so it would have been Arnold Schwarzenegger as Reese and O.J. Simpson as the Terminator. So I think that movie would not have become a classic. That maybe, maybe wouldn't have had this uh the same no impact. but it probably during the oj simpson trial would have gotten a lot it of would have gotten a lot of heat back then yeah, yeah. it would have gotten a lot yeah, of he's heat. playing the terminator he was but and then he, and ultimately he did yeah. ultimately he just yeah. was or maybe he could you know maybe would have gotten it out of his system I who knows know. who knows what would have happened i think it's best that it worked out the yeah. way that it worked yeah. out well you know what even back then we knew how to say no Right. Well, no is a very powerful word. Yes. When it's a very hard word when you're doing something new because you want to... Yeah, but you know what? You, <laughs> you can't go back and fix it later because at that point, if you really screw up your first chance, it's your only chance and you don't get a second one. Right. But you can't think about that too much when you're doing something because if you're like, oh, I don't want to fuck this up. I don't want to fuck this up. Like, that's a bad way. No, to... but you there there are some there are some bridges that you just can't cross. And one of those would have been casting O.J. Simpson as the Terminator. <laughs> <That would have> been... <laughs> I think we can safely say yeah. the correct decision was made at the time. Does your does your work dynamic shift based on who you're working with? Like, did you work differently with Jim than you would with someone else? I mean, how do you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's what a good producer does. Um, you learn how to be the strategic partner of whoever you're, whoever you're working with to bring their vision to life. Right. And, you know, so, so each time it's, it's a little bit different. And, uh, you know, there, there are some people who, you know, need me to be the bad guy. Um, and oftentimes there are people who um, could very well be the bad guy themselves. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they, they need to be kept away from, from that, from, you know, from drawing the line, line in the sand. Uh, so part of the time, that's me. And another part of the time, it's there's some people who are writers, showrunners, or directors who actually don't have great rapport with a cast. Right. Which sounds funny, but, you know, that they may be great at lining up a shot or writing a script. Um, you know, so then I become very close with the cast. And, you know, and, and I have to often set parameters for them as well. Um, but, um, you know, e each time it's a little bit different. But you... I will back away from something if I don't share the same vision with the the showrunner. Because if I if I can't make something better, I'd rather not make it at all. Right. Well, and that's dangerous for because you're really the economy in this business is the reputation that you have. Like that's the most important economy of your career is what is your reputation as a as someone who can make things happen and also as someone like you said, don't work with assholes. But you so many things can go wrong in the process of a of a film being made that it that can keep it from being a good movie. What do you do when you're like, you know, seven eighths of the way into a project and all of a sudden you go, oh shit, something's happening that's not quite what we had all hoped it would happen. Uh, well, you know, if it's within one's control to fix. You do. Um, and if it's not, then um, then you just kind of carry on and 
hope for the best. I mean, that's the, the that's the, the surprising thing. I mean, especially in a feature film, um, it's not surprising for you know people to have a month of reshoots. I remember we shoot an episode of The Walking Dead in eight days. Oh, it's crazy. So I mean, you know, that's that's like uh, you know that's like almost four episodes for us, right? You know, to go back and and get a, a feature film sort of fixed, but y- you can do that. It's you have to be much, much more on top of your game in television than in features, and that was my big, that was my big wake up call. Is you are churning out an episode every eight days, mm-hmm. and you've moved on, and the choices that you've made in serialized television in an early episode resonates all the way through. You can't then go back and you know change that thread. Because no. it affects it, it'll affect every episode that you've already shot. So the stakes are much higher in television. Did, was Terminator exactly the way that you had envisioned it? The did it turn out exactly how you thought it would? Um, it it, it turned it, tur- it turned out better, I have to say, um, because you never know how the stop motion animation is going to appear. Right. And interestingly enough, um, the guy who who stop motion animated. The Terminator at toward the end in that uh, was the late Peter Kleinow, who was a slide guitarist for the Flying Burrito Brothers. Oh, really? Yes. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? So he just he he, he turned you know his back on music, and loved stop motion animation, and he was one of the best in the business. Oh my God! I had no idea. I mean, I didn't know that that was the guy that was the guy from yep. the Flying Burrito Brothers. Uh. When do you, were, the, were there shots in the movie that you had wanted to? I mean, did anything not quite like? Oh, we want to have this one big thing, and then you saw it, and you're like, ah, eh, just we're not there yet. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we we did a few pickups. Um, well, there was there's one scene um, in sort of the the flash forward into the future, and you know you see the skulls being crushed, and you know what the human survivors are up against in the future where the machines have taken over. And I remember that the, the sun was about to come up. It was a night shoot and, you know, and, and literally we had to get everything, we had to get everything done. And I, and I think I'm like push, pushing the dolly and, and Jim is, <laughs> you know, and Jim's got like the camera and everyone else was just exhausted and we just did it. And the same thing, there's a scene, um, at the very end, when Sarah Connor is in the Jeep driving yeah. away, you know, and there's a storm coming and all of that. And, you know, the the uh, the photograph of, um, you know, that that's essentially the photograph that that John Connor falls in love with her um, or Kyle Reese falls in love with her. Right. From um, that. Jim and I shot it with three people out in the desert, the car driving. Um, my assistant at the time was doubling Sarah Connor. Um, my mother's dog <laughs> was, was, the, was the German shepherd. And we had been setting up all day for the right heat waves because it's not something that really you could have added easily back then. Um, and we were out in the middle of nowhere in like Lancaster. We hadn't seen a car all day and a police car drives up. <laughs> and asks us for our permit. Oh, which, in the middle of Lancaster. Which I mean, literally, we were in the no other car had been anywhere that he was born. all day, and asked for our permit, and we, we didn't have a permit. <laughs> so back then, we were like, I, I was like, oh my god, this is another thing that a producer has to do. What do you say when you haven't got the shot yet and you have to get? And it's like. I, I'm sorry, officer. I, I didn't realize that. Um, you know, we're we're at UCLA Film School. There you go. Um, because there were only four of us. It wasn't like it could right. possibly be a feature film. <laughs> it wasn't like, not like it could be one of the movies that would transform cinema and, or anything. Uh, and and it was like, uh, and and I said, wow. I mean, you know, this is this is like public land, and and he's like, I know, but your camera is in the street. I mean, it, it, it's 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 a public hazard. <laughs> and we're like, okay. We'll, we'll move it off the road. He said, okay, you kids, have fun. I hope your film turns out well. 
<laughs> it's too bad you couldn't invite that guy to the premiere. I yeah. I mean, you know what? We still owe him a lot because we wouldn't have had that shot. You wouldn't have had that last shot at the very end. But you know, it's watching what you do with sequels is all is a really big deal because not all sequels turn out great. But, you know, with Aliens and with Terminator 2, I mean, Terminator 2 just changed everything. That completely, there are effects in that movie that still ha- aren't, haven't been outdone. No. It's unbelievable. It, it really is unbelievable. Well, you know what? That is the genius of Jim Cameron. I mean, Jim Cameron is a genius. There aren't that many people who change filmmaking and the way that we that we look at films and the way we appreciate films and the way that films are conceived. And Jim's one of them, obviously George Lucas, mm-hmm. um, um, Chris Nolan. I mean, they, you know, they're, they're just Martin Scorsese in a different way, but the, you know, um, Ridley, Ridley Scott, but they, they change the way that we appreciate film, um, the way that we appreciate entertainment and it's in their heads. And literally with Jim, it's waiting for the technology to catch up. Right. He's always known because I, I listened to him tell me these stories back in 1979 that we just now have the technology <laughs> to put on screen. <laughs> but he also... Well, he invents them. I he mean, he's inve- got yeah. Oscars for inventing the technology. But also, no, but also having the foresight to go, okay, I know we can't do this right now, but in a few years... Right. This I mean, is when, be... when we did, when we did, and by the way, that's the amazing thing about Aliens is that it really holds up, even though it's a, it's an analog film. Right. I mean, there are no CGI effects or anything. It really holds up. I mean, having just seen it a few months ago, uh, you go, you know what? There isn't anything I'd really change. Yeah. And, um, and then with The Abyss, that was the first 3D CGI effect that ILM had ever made, have, had ever created, the water snake in right. that. Right. And the, the funny thing is that, you know, no one at 20th Century Fox asked us how we were going to pull off that effect. I mean, that was like the one thing in which the film would, would sink or swim. Ha. Huh. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, y- you have someone like Dennis Muren who took a year off to learn how to create CGI and having an approach to effects with algorithms as opposed to computer algorithms, as opposed to miniatures and, um, you know, um, uh, stop motion or go motion animation. And, you know, so the, the, this, the great people and the great companies are always pushing the edge of the envelope and, and learning it themselves. But there's always, I mean, you know, part of it, I guess you could say like, well, it's sort of like, asking Picasso like well why how do you do this you know it's just like well it's just what he that's what he does but I feel like in the process people who you know people like yourself or people like James James Cameron you're obviously asking different questions than people normally ask if you're going to if you consistently get this result of something that is unlike a thing that it's it's interesting I think first of all even though you know I'm an old old lady now um I I, in my, in my mind, in um, the way that I approach the world, I'm still 14. Right. And I think that's absolutely essential. I mean, it's one of the reasons that I was so attracted to my new project, to Falling Water, because I've always been fascinated by what our minds are capable of. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that we haven't examined very much um, is dreams. Mm Mm-hmm. And the fact that that image in the Terminator came to Jim in a fever dream. So this is, it's a show that examines lucid dreaming, dreaming, and how great an impact that can have, not only on individual lives, but also on the world. And that's something that we haven't done before. I mean, the, the, the script, the initial script was written by the showrunner Blake Masters and the late Henry Brummel, who was on Homeland mm-hmm. um, back during the writer strike before Inception, before Sense8. So when a lot of people sort of hit on the same thing at the same time, it's in the zeitgeist. And the really remarkable thing that we've since found out after we filmed the series is part of it deals with, can you actually hack into someone else's dreams? Turns out we can. 
neuroscientists are hacking into people's dreams. So once again, I mean, if you, so if you look at being aware and open to things that other people aren't thinking of, that's, that's, you know, Chris Nolan in Inception, that's Blake and Henry in Falling Water. Um, but I think a, a, a lot of people fail in something else, um, which is, yeah, really out there ideas and imagery are fantastic, but in television and features we care about people. So we need to make sure that at the end of the day, the people are as compelling as the visuals and all of the cool stuff. Right. And that's where Jim succeeds. That's where Robert Kirkman succeeds. You know, that's where, that's where the, the great people really succeed. That's all the storytelling. I, you know, for probably the last year, I've been saying to people, I wish someone would remake Dreamscape. Because, and we just watched it again a couple nights ago, because I just, I love it. I mean, the, the effects in the movie are very 80s. Yep. I mean, it's very 80s. There's, you know, there's a lot of stop motion. It's not, it's not, it's not amazing. But just that idea, you know, so it, I'm glad that that's actually <laughs> coming back. Because yeah. that's a, that hasn't, no one's really, that hasn't really been a, a, a part of the pop culture conversation for quite a but, while. Well, think about it. I mean, you know, how many hours a night do we dream? You know, uh, <laughs> I guess really, but it's short though, right? You're just getting little bursts of dreams. But how powerful are they? Yeah. I mean, the, the research that's been done as to how dreams affect us, it's, it's really remarkable. It's kind of funny too when you, when you start looking into it, like, why do people dream? And they're like, well, you don't really know. Like, some theories suggest that it's your brain's way of just f sorting information and sort, you know, because it, you really only are aware of, you know, such a small percentage of what your brain is actually absorbing that it's just kind of a way to sort all that stuff and all that imagery. But, you know, the idea, the fact that your body has to shut itself down so that you you don't act out your dreams that i mean there's there's definitely something i don't know if it's a i don't know if it was an evolutionary accident if dreams were an evolutionary accident or but it's interesting because you know animals dream as well right um and there's a really interesting uh neuroscientist who's um who's got a, a fantastic ted talk um moran surf and he he really deals with a, a lot of what dreaming is and how dreams can be mapped. Uh, it's become his area of expertise. And I, and I have a feeling that it's going to be, uh, it's going to be not an unusual field of study. Right now it is. People kind of think of dreams like, oh, yeah, dreams. I mean, but it turns out that they are incredibly important. Right. Um, and, and I think that um, even, you know, people say they don't dream, but they do. They just don't remember them. Right. And there are ways that you can train yourself to remember your dreams. I mean, certain people, um, a lot of people, whether, you know, Einstein, other people, actually, a lot of, a lot of the solutions to problems they were faced with, um, they discovered in their dreams. And some people um, have arranged for... Um, like, you know, a lot of times you, you sort of jerk when you're in REM sleep, um, that they, they set up devices where they wake themselves up afterward. And if you've awakened after you've had a vivid dream like that, you can remember everything and they write it down. It turns out there are a lot of problems that people are facing in their everyday lives that can be solved if they're able to tap into what they've experienced in their dreams. So how do you juggle all of the everything that, that you because these are not all small projects um you know luckily my daughter's all grown up <laughs> um and uh but yeah i mean it's it, it's tough it, it's tough i don't sleep much um so I, I i gotta so i must be a very active dreamer in those short hours that i'm asleep right but you know i it it's just important for me to to stay on top of of everything. I, I try to be with each show, whether it's Walking Dead or Fear the Walking Dead or Falling Water. I am there as much as possible through prep, through the first few episodes. Um, and then I bop back and forth. Yeah. I mean, do you, is it strange to, was it strange to be in relationship with someone that you're like, where you see him at work and it's like, I got to see him at home too. Like what's the separation of 
home life and work life and how was that important? Um, well, I wasn't all that effective um, having had two ex-husbands that I worked with, and Jim Cameron and Brian De Palma. Um, but I've, I've worked with my current husband, um, Jonathan Hensley, and we work together really well. And the funny thing is that, is that Brian still wants me to produce with him, and Jim and I are still really, really good friends. So, uh, so I guess I, I managed to walk that tightrope. Um, but it's, it, it, it's tough. It's, it's really tough because, you know, you have no off time. Right. I mean, and... Because, you know, you'll go out to dinner and invariably it's not going to talk about, you're not going to talk about the food or the great, or the great environment. You're going to be talking about, you know, that, that setup we have to get tomorrow or that asshole note that we just got from the studio. <laughs> but bringing it home, emotionally bringing it home, like that just feels, because there's no, I mean, this is a business where, it, you know, it's not, you don't punch a clock and then you punch a clock and then it's done. It just you just do it until the thing you're working on is done and then you do something else yeah, and it, I mean, it, you're with it 24 so seven. It's nice to be with someone who really doesn't know what's going on in, you know, that stressful part of your life. Right. You can deal with the things that they're, you know, focusing on. So, you know, but my, my husband and I, I mean, we love, we love skiing. <laughs> we love to go skiing. You know, he's one of the best skiers you'll ever see. I'm a permanent intermediate. Mm -hmm. um, and we love Arsenal soccer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So that's why I'm Gunnar Gale on Twitter. I know. I know. I, I really, when I first met you and we ta you talked to me about soccer, I'm like, what do you like about it? And you explained to me and you... So, and I started trying to watch soccer, and I just can't find an emotional way in. You don't have any time, Chris. Well, that's you don't true. have enough time. It, it takes a commitment. Actually, what, what hooked me was going to see a match in person. I mean, just watching it on TV is not the same as being there in person. Got it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's going to be a, a screening of Aliens um, in London. Um, the symphony orchestra at Royal Albert Hall is going to be playing the score while they project it. When is that happening? It's in November. It's in early November. Holy so shit. Jim and Sigourney and I are going. And it just so happens that that weekend is also the most important Arsenal match of the season, which is their home tie uh, against their arch rivals, Tottenham Hotspur, which is called the Lon a London Derby. Um, and in this case, the North London Derby. So I am going to be there. You're going to go to the and game? I'm going to try. Are you going to fist fight people? I, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going to hide the brass knuckles maybe to let me in. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm going to try to get uh, Jim and Sigourney to go. Oh, that'd be amazing. Have they? Did, but you haven't been... You weren't into soccer in the 80s, right? This no. is the Right. No. No, this was... Uh, no, I, I started following Arsenal only after their, like, best years ever. Right. But that's a true fan. A true fan follows the team when they're struggling and doesn't give up on them. So what do you think these partnerships that you had, what, what, are, you, what are you teaching? Like when you're working with Jim or, or, or with, what are you teaching and what are you learning? Because I feel like the positive side to a partnership like that is that you can talk to someone that you're in a relationship with way deeper than with someone that you are just working with. Correct? You know, I mean, what I pride myself on is really getting into their heads to the point where I know, I know the question they're going to ask me before they ask it. I've got the answer before they ask it. And, and that's just what you have to do as a producer. Um, and, and I know when, you know, when to bring something to their attention. And, and if I can't get that intimate um, on a project with someone, I'm really not going to do my job as well. Um, so, you know, a lot of times it's learning people's body language. Like when I worked with Ang Lee on the Hulk, I learned, I mean, that, that if I could read his body language, I knew what was bothering him and I knew how to deal with it. Um, you know, and, and people thought it was strange that I kind of knew what was going on before he could say anything, but that's because part of my job is to figure out how to get inside someone else's head. And if it's, you know, if it's body language, that's one thing. Some people 
will, you know, you just have to say, you know, shut up. Okay, I get it. <laughs> um, but there are other people that, that you have to, to find another way in. Um, so, you know, it's so when you when you go home with someone, you know, the the, the good news is that, um, you know, that you can kind of continue the discussion. The bad news is you can never turn it off. Right. Were, are there consistencies with these types of people, with these types of directors? Do you see, you know, whether it's Brian or Jim or Ang Lee or, or any of great director that you've worked with, do you see consistencies in how they see the world or how they process? Or they, 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 they're absolutely. They literally have the whole movie in their head. And the frustrating part to them is that no one else has it. So <laughs> I try to get into their heads too so that I can help communicate what it is they want from the actors um, on a shot, in post-production, um, you know, Ang Lee calls shooting um, shopping and post-production and editing cooking. Oh, wow. And, and that's really where it is. I mean, they're getting all of the ingredients that they need. So it's, you know, it's not surprising that, you know, Jim not only writes and directs, but he essentially shoots and edits his films. I mean, you know, Avatar is like the world's biggest home movie. <laughs> <laughs> Le- legitimately the world's yes. biggest. Yes. Um, you know, so so you know, so John Landau his producer really needs to know where he can where he can help because Jim doesn't need a lot of help. Mm-hmm. He literally can do everyone's job. And he can do better it better than 90% of the people uh who've probably won academy awards doing that job. And and that's tough. It's tough because what you then have to essentially just be, you know, a continuation of Jim and you have to be able to to transmit his vision. Sure. Well, how is that different to how Brian works? It's the same thing with Brian. I mean, these are all people who who have the films in their heads. The the problem with a lot of directors these days, um, and and I, we used to call it sort of the MTV effect. There would be all these all these quick cuts and people would just line up five or six cameras on every shot. Well, that's shopping. Right. But that's like putting the entire store in your grocery cart. Right. Um, and, and, and there's no, there's not really a vision there. Right. Well, that's kind of how a reality show works. Yeah. You just shoot everything and then, well, we'll just cobble together, see what we get. And then we'll, we'll cobble but, together. But that's not, that's not the case with, with Brian or with Jim or, you know, or with Ang or in any of the great directors. Um, they, they, I mean, look, you know, look at Clint Eastwood, you know, I haven't worked with him, but, you know, he, he's like two takes and he's on because he knows he's, knows he's got it. Right. I, I just don't understand how, what, how, what it would be like working with someone who had no idea if they had it, you know. I mean, they're just going to, you know, take 27 and it's no different than take four but yeah. they don't know you can tell when a director when everything was intentional it's like you can't watch the untouchables and then go hmm maybe he fudged that like everything is so exactly the way it's supposed to be in that movie that there it's almost like well it couldn't have been any other way it has to be it has to be exactly this way so how do they communicate you know they must they must have to have almost a, a kind of a, a twin mind meld with their DP, right? Yeah. I mean, well, that's why Jim is sort of his own DP anyway. Um, and you'll find that, the, that these directors work with the same people over and over again. And, you know, now we have visual tools. We have animatics. We have, you know, we have previs. That you, you can, can show it. everyone, right. you can see, you know, the, so even though an actor is acting against a, a green screen, they kind of know because of the previs what's really going on. That's why I'm so impressed with, you know, people like David Lean. They had nothing like that. And there so many flawless films that were directed before we had this kind of technology. And yes, m- you know, maybe we, there weren't the visual effects, but to me, um, you know, um, Lawrence of Arabia is one of the perfect movies. The transitions, everything about that. And the cameras were huge, and they shot it in the desert. I mean, you know, it was 108 degrees or more. Um, and, and yet, without any of the technology we have right now, films were just as good as not better. Are you, 
happy that you didn't pursue directing as a career? I wouldn't have been that good a director. I, you know, when you when you realize that there are geniuses out there, and you'd be a journeyman, you'd be <laughs> as good as good as you know, as good as some, um, or maybe even most. That's not good enough. I mean, you know, I'd rather be the person who's helping the geniuses, helping the ones that, you know, are one in a million, one in a billion, um, get their visions. You know, it used to be on celluloid. Uh, now it's uh, <laughs> on digital. Do you always feel like you know what you're doing? Like, do you, do you ever feel like, oh, shit, I don't really know the answer to this, but I better pretend like no, I... No, I never. No, I don't pretend. You always... I, I, I think that's... I mean, look, that's where we've gotten into a lot of trouble in the world with people just pretending to know stuff they <laughs> right, don't. Right, right. Uh, and by the way, I do have to say, we still shoot The Walking Dead on film. Still shoot on film? Yes. Yep, we still shoot on Super 16. As long as they keep making Super 16, <laughs> we'll keep shooting. Well, I would imagine if it ever seems like they're not going to, they would just buy all of it. It was like Charles Schultz, when they found out he was, they were discontinuing his pens, he just bought yeah. every last of that pen. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and Crawford Film Lab in Atlanta still processes film only because of us. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, there is this really interesting industry that has, like in Sonoy and just this whole thing that has, that will always be there now. I mean, at some point, there'll be a Walking Deadland. I'm positive there will be a Walking <laughs> Dead theme park. It's at some point. There's no way that's not going to happen. Yes, uh, it's probably true. We'll have animatronic Ricks. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then a Carl that just kind of grows, but not, you can't, you can't really. I just want to, I, as I said, what I want to do before was just read a bunch of the stuff for people so that they know, obviously, Terminator, Aliens, uh, Alien Nation, which was a great movie. Oh, I loved that movie. I love that movie. That's that's one of those like oh I got to go back and watch that again. It was pretty crazy too. I mean because Jimmy Kahn, Mandy Patinkin, Terrence Stamp, um, you got Jimmy Kahn who's like he, he he's like okay two two takes I'm done and Mandy's like take seventeen he's like I'm warming up <laughs> and they're in every scene together. Oh my god. Yeah. Um. All right. Tremors. Fantastic. Tremors. Yeah. What is it about? What do you see? Because I feel like a lot of the stuff that you take on is stuff that hasn't really been seen yet or done yet. <laughs> and so, how do you, you know? Mean giant worms? Well, yeah. Giant underground sandworms. So, how do you know? How do you know when something comes across your lap? Because you I'm read... because I'm permanently fourteen. Okay. And I read the script and I go, "Wow, I'd love to see that." You know, and that movie cost under ten million dollars to make. And, you know, and I mean, Kevin Bacon, how, how amazing, you know, Fred Ward, uh, Reba McIntyre, Michael Gross. I mean, it, it, it really was. Um, and, and I have to thank um, the late Jim Jacks, who is a fantastic producer. Uh, he was responsible for Kevin Smith's career. Oh, wow. Uh, who passed away a few years ago, who was an executive at Universal at the time, who basically bet his career and got the film greenlit. And everything worked out for him after. Yes, that. yes. <laughs> when so after a movie like Terminator hits, do people go, "Okay, now you can do whatever you want," or do you still feel like you always have to fight? And or are you a are you a scrapper or are you a floater? Because I feel like some people have to fight, 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 and other people very just like, "Okay, it'll you know it'll all oh, work I'm out." I'm a scrapper. You're a scrapper. Oh yeah. I mean, if I haven't earned it. Through hard work, I, I feel like I don't deserve I don't deserve it, and and because you're pushing through something, that's when you realize it's worth doing. Because if you give up, you go, you know what? Then then it wasn't right. Right. So I, I'm much better if I have to fight. Then I mean I would not be good as a floater. So do you seek that stuff out? Then do you seek out the, the hard stuff? The, the of hard course, stuff? yeah. My God, I mean I remember you know when when Frank and I first talked about the walking days, like I don't want to talk about it. You know, we developed a script at NBC. It was sent out everywhere and everywhere everyone everyone passed. It's like let's let's not give up. I mean you know maybe there's the right home for it. Um, so yeah, I mean, but I need a partner. I need a partner to go forward 
and you know and and, and fight um i i i'm very I, I like being a team player because your chemistry changes with each like you were saying before your chemistry changes with each new team with each new person yes because you have to you you, you know it's it, it's it's you know you it's dynamic and fluid and you 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 know it's not my way or the highway really um although as i said i won't work with assholes so if it's an asshole <laughs> it's the highway for them um but but otherwise you know you 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 have to find the the best way to work with someone as part of a team i mean you know it's like it's you can use a sports analogy certain teams gel um and others don't and sometimes you have you know maybe you have to get rid of your best player because that person may be the best player, but they're the, not the best team. Member. Those are the not fun decisions. To have to make. And then have to deliver, to have to be the hatchet person to be like, sorry. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's part of the job. I mean, it's, it's part of the job when someone comes in and, and you know, I'm not going to name names, but there was someone that I thought would be fantastic in The Walking Dead. And, um, and I remember Frank going, yeah, they're really good, but I, I don't think that the chemistry is going to be right. And you know this, but a lot of people may not, that we cast John Bernthal as Shane. He was the first person cast on the series, not Andy Lincoln. Because and we hadn't even seen Andy Lincoln's audition at that point. I mean, we were literally getting to the point where we were going to be starting, you know, we were going to start pre-production, and we didn't have the lead in the show. Right. Um, and so we, you know, so we flew Andy over and he read with John and was like, this is great. Um, you know, he's, he's our, he's our Rick. Um, but you know, I, I, there was someone else I would have settled for and it would have been wrong. So was it hard for you when Frank wasn't on the show anymore? You know, it's, it's, it was, it's hard for anyone when someone who is essentially, um, invented something reinvented let's say because obviously kirkman invented it right um and um you know and that kind of partnership because he'd hired the cast and the crew um you know it's 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 really tough and i have to say i mean i called frank when all this went down and i said you know um what do you want me to do uh and he said stay with the show and uh, I don't think I, I don't know that I could have if he hadn't said that because that would have been a betrayal. Yeah. And he said that to every cast member on the show. Wow. To everyone. He proactively said, um, you know, this is not your fight. Um, you've made something wonderful. And go do the best job you can. Well, I'm glad you stayed on the show. <laughs> I have a, this is going to, I, please forgive me. I hope this doesn't sound like an arrogant male question, but just because of what you, something you said when we first started talking, when you said, you know, in 1978, there were no female producers, there were no female heads of networks. So as you embark on that career in the late seventies and the early eighties, what are you facing in terms of gender discrimination and what are you, and how are you overcoming it? Or are you just ignoring it and just focusing you know, on work? The, the interesting thing is, at Roger Corman, there was none. So Roger had a chief operating officer, uh, Barbara Boyle. So she was second in command at the company. Um, his wife, Julie Corman, was producing for him and very involved. And he treated women with the utmost respect. I mean, you know, and he was an equal opportunity exploiter. I mean, he exploited everyone. <laughs> we worked for no money. He realized that women were would work harder and complain less i mean that was probably the only difference that that he saw um and that often women um you know had uh if they wanted to succeed um th their drive and ambition was you know was 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 not only equal to but probably exceeded men's and um so I, for the first few years working for roger corman there was no sexism. So I assumed wrongly that that was the case throughout the industry. But, you know, working under working for Roger, you were in this little bubble, you were in this little Corman bubble. Um, the only time I'd been in a studio a lot was because we used MGM labs 
to process our film um, for the films we made. So I'd go into the MGM lot, which is now the Sony lot, and, and but I wasn't interacting with any of the executives. Uh, so it was only after that that uh, that I realized that you know when when I went in um, to produce Aliens for the the meeting. And, you know, and I met at Fox, and the first question was, how can a little girl like you produce a big movie like this? Oh, boy. And, uh, and, and, and I actually, luckily, didn't take it personally. I thought, okay, well, that's, that may not be a fair question, but, you know, they need a, they need a reasonable response. So I said, call Roger Corman. He can vouch for me. And call the head of film finances in Los Angeles, Lindsley Parsons, who provided the completion bond for the Terminator, and they'll tell you. Don't take my word for it. And the good news was he made those calls to two very responsible, well-respected men, and they both said, God, she's great. Snap her up. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't have a chip on my shoulder. And, and I think that's a, a, a problem is, you know, you can either, you, because you can succeed. You need, you need someone to say yes. You need someone to open the door. Um, and you need to reach out and pull the next, the next generation up. Yeah. Um, and and when, I was, when I was starting out, a lot of women would slam the door in your face because, you know, there was a token woman. They'd, there'd be a token woman, you know, at a company. And they knew that it was going to be a revolving door. There was that one person, and if someone else was hired, they were gone. So it was actually that was how women in film um, was was originally founded. It was to say, no, we don't have to be the token woman. Right. We can be a team of women. And have you mentored people uh, over the years? You know, I, I I think it's 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 not sort of a formal mentorship, but absolutely. Um, Quite a few people. I mean, um, Shonda Rhimes' partner Betsy Beers uh, started at my company and ran, you know ran my company. Um, so you know there there are a lot of people who are in various positions throughout the industry. Well, I'm sure now, and, and 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 also a lot of a lot of women directors. But I'm sure now, if you're doing panels or if you're if you're, I'm sure uh, young women must st- stand up and go, hey, how you know how do I get around, you know, the sexism and how do I get around, how do, you know, what's the best way to deal Be with damn it? damn good. <laughs> I mean, that, that is, I mean, a lot of people actually feel that, um, you know, well, unqualified men get opportunities all the time, so why can't unqualified women? It's like, no, let's just raise the bar for, let's raise the bar and everyone should be qualified and everyone should be good. Um, you know, and and I really think that that it's important to not just say, well, it's not fair. Um, you know, be good. Be good at your craft. You know, when, when, when I was producing, I wouldn't have gotten to produce another film after Terminator if I hadn't been damn good at my job mm-hmm. uh, and prepared so that when the opportunity was there, I succeeded. Uh, so there's, you know, there, there's no, there is no shortcut to doing your homework being prepared, being over-prepared. And, um, you know, so I, I think the biggest problem that a lot of people make today is, well, you know, when I get that opportunity, then I'll learn. You know, in the meantime, I'll, you know, I'll just bide my time and complain. Right. But I think that's, I mean, I see that, I see that with, I mean, that doesn't have a gender. No, like, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, everyone. That's what I'm saying. It's I, I like saying you. if they, you know, just because unqualified men have an opportunity, right. unqual- it, it should no, no. Let's raise the bar for everybody. I see, I see people complaining about stuff all the time. Like, I mean, oh, don't they think you can be like a stand up and do what you do? It's like just put a, give me a microphone and I'll be you. Yeah, well, I always encourage people like do it, you just do it, absolutely, you know, do it. And then see what it feels like, and then if you if it, if you want to keep doing it when you see how much work it is, then you're doing the right thing. And if you stop, then maybe you weren't doing the right thing because you the only thing that will 
allow you to have any lasting success is that you have to give a shit about what you're doing. You know, it, and it's funny. It's people <laughs> like, well, I, I need so many millions of dollars to make a movie. No, you don't. Especially not now. The camera, I have this the iPhone 7. The camera on this phone is ridiculous. So, so that's what I say. I mean, did you see the movie Tangerine? Yes, yes. It's fantastic. We're shot on iPhones. <laughs> you know? Um, so so there, there is no excuse anymore. It's, it's, I think people are actually sort of creating obstacles for themselves, thinking that everything needs to be perfect for them to get to the next level. Right. You know, they need to have, they need to have a, you know, an Oscar winning DP and they need to have a, you know, Oscar winning cast. It's like, no, get great people who are at your level. I mean, that's the way Roger succeeded. All of us had no credits when we started for him, but we learned and we learned without a huge spotlight on us. So make your mistakes before there's a spotlight on you. Oh, that's well, there's a spotlight on everything now. There's no, I mean, because, you know, the good thing about social media and the way that you can. Right, if it's good. Right. If it's good, it'll rise up. But I also feel like there's no risk because, you know, let's say you make a thing and you, oh, I'm going to put it on YouTube or I'll throw it on Facebook or whatever. Uh, if it's not very good, you learned a bunch. And if, if no one watches it, it doesn't really affect you. You know, if it's really good, it, maybe it'll catch on. And if it doesn't catch on, what did you learn from that? And what's the next thing you can do? And how can you reapply those things? I mean, it really is just not taking no for an answer and not, you know, you can have your feelings hurt once in a while, but don't make excuses. Yeah. So, so you know, go out and do it. Go out. There is absolutely no substitute for doing it. Don't just talk about it. Do it. Do you have, just as we're kind of winding this down, are there a couple, one or two stories you can think about with think with movies that you've worked on that that really kind of changed your life where you're you know i don't know if it was on aliens or or, or whatever it was but you're standing there and you're watching something happen and you go oh my god this is unlike any this is a this is an a special unique moment in time can you think of anything you know it, it, it's funny because it, this is something that Working for Roger Corman was the best training for making a TV series in eight days Mm -hmm. because you have to do everything immediately and, um, you know, you don't get a do-over. But I remember, since both Jim and I trained there, I remember we were shooting the Terminator and there was a point at which the Terminator punches his fist through um, the front window of a moving car. Mm-hmm. That uh, that um, Reese and Sarah Connor are in, um, and it had to be—I mean, it had to be a hydraulic ram. So it was a metal fist that that Stan Winston came up with, and we realized it was really unsafe to do that um, <laughs> with a moving car. But we had to simulate it moving, and I'm like, well, I don't know what to do. And it's not like, you know, we, did, we couldn't put up a green screen. There was no time. We had to do it that day. It was the only time we had the location. And that's when you know that Jim's a genius. Because he said, I know what we're going to do. We're going to put up a flat of, of half-inch brick on the grip truck. And the grip truck will drive by. And we'll try it at different speeds until it looks like the car's moving. <laughs> and that shot is in the film. And, and it's, it's genius. I mean, there's just no way you can look at it and think, no, that car wasn't moving. Um, and, and Jim just came up with it on the fly. And that's when you realize you're working with someone who's just, he's a problem solver. He's a genius. And it was, it was the low tech solution. Right. Um, and, and, and that's why to, to this day, I prefer low tech solutions. If you can get it in camera, that's the best way to get it. And that, to me, you know, that hasn't changed. Well, that's Jim, though. What did you? What about you? What are you proudest of that you've done? That what are you proud of when you think back? Like, you know, what's what's the thing that really makes you feel like, oh, this was a defining moment for me, or this really was a, I'm I'm really proud that I did this thing or pulled this off. Uh, you know, it's funny because um, I, I tend not to think of what it is that I've done because um, that's all in a day's work. Um, I do recall, though, that um, when we were making The Abyss, um, that, which, by the way, cost about $40 million. So think about that. I mean, that, that's like you can't get shoot six people sitting around in a room talking these days for, <laughs> on a feature film for that. And uh, we were doing the sequence when, um, when the submersible is filling with water. Mm-hmm. 
and and Lindsay and um, and Bud are um, are drowning. Um, so Mary Elizabeth and Ed Harris, and we had to shoot it up over a number of days. And we had the submersible um, hanging from a crane, and um, and we were lowering it in water. Um, and um, a genius executive from 20th Century Fox came out and decided he was going to get us on budget. Um, so he came in, and the entire time he was there, he kept looking at his watch because uh, he had come out in a limo, all of us had like the cheapest renter, rental cars possible. And he's coming in to talk to you about budget. And and he's and he would only stay in a five star hotel, which was two hours away. We were all staying at the Days Inn mm-hmm. uh, for ten dollars more. Uh, you got the view, <laughs> which was of the giant peach <laughs> water tank on the freeway that looked like a giant ass because <laughs> it was painted pink and had a crack. So for ten dollars more, you got a view of the the world's biggest ass. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, that person walks in um, and uh, and tells us that he's going to save us money. So he's decided that one of the ways he's going to save us money is to get cheaper cranes. Oh, well, we're in the m- middle of shooting the sequence, right? It is a huge building boom in the South at the time. We we're shooting in in, in uh, South Carolina, and so he told the crane operators to go home in not nice language and they're southern baptists oh boy um and he said that they that you know he that they he that they must have thought that you know he was a stupid hollywood executive who would pay too much for um you know for their equipment but you know he was going to teach them a lesson um and um and and i'm literally sitting in this meeting and then he goes, okay, got to go to Hilton Head and go, you know, I got a tennis match this afternoon. <laughs> he was taking a private jet. <laughs> and I'm like, we're back on budget if we just had your private jet costs and your limo and the five-star hotel and the price of getting you here. We're back on budget. And, and I remember having to go talk to these people and beg them not to take their cranes after they'd just been insulted by a jerk from Hollywood um, who used every... F- you know, took the Lord's name in vain and used every foul expletive in the book and get them not to take their crane, Where, which, by the way, they could have gotten three times as much money as they were charging us in the construction business. Oh, my God. And, I mean, that seems like a small thing, but that's what you have to do. And, uh, and also, um, you know, and, and the funny thing is this executive then went back to L.A. and... Um, and gave us three extra days of filming. <laughs> so I, I I don't know. I mean, he probably thought that he won, that he that he won the crane battle. Um, and I have a feeling that the fantastic physical production executive who was out there probably lied to him and said, "Yeah, you saved the day. You know, we we got some cheaper cranes." But that's really smart because he, that's really smart on your guys's part. Because I feel like I would, if someone were like that, I'd be like, uh, "Hey, how about go fuck yourself?" Which is not gonna get you what you want so you must you must also know i guess you must also have a thing where you go okay i'm just gonna let this person go because ultimately it's not going to get us what we want if i'm defensive yeah because well i'd also realized um once when i was in a meeting and uh, i was so angry that i stood up and walked out of the meeting slammed the door and realized i'd left my office (laughs) 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 and i was like Oh, I can't get any work done. I just slammed the door and left my own office. Do you go back in and go, hey, I, uh, you guys leave. And slam the door on your way out, or you just have to wait. So, so anyway, so no, you, you, know, you kind of learn from those, those early errors uh, that, that, doesn't, that just makes you look stupid. Yeah, but you, do, but you must have to know when to, like, when the, when to put on the fangs and when to Yeah, go. I mean, you, you have to, you know, you you. You always need to know when, um, when literally you have to say no, and uh, we we the filmmaking is the, and and making TV is the art of compromise. You always have to know when the compromise is too great, and you have to be able to walk away 
at that point. So on the Terminator, that would have been having Arnold Schwarzenegger play Kyle Reese and O.J. Simpson, <laughs> Simpson play the Terminator. Terminator. And you have to be willing to say, no, I, I can't do that, and I'm going to you know, possibly not make this film, because if I do that, it can't be a good movie. So, so the, you, you know, but, but you, you, you don't get many of those, and you better be right each time you, you know, every, every, every time you, you throw down that gauntlet, you better be right. And I guess that's just a gut feeling, or you just have to know that you what know, you're doing. You have to think about it, um, and um, and and you you have to be willing because oftentimes, remember, it's not just me that's going to suffer; it's everyone on the show at the time. So, whoever your partner is, the you know writer, director, the showrunner, any cast, you're affecting the crew. You're affecting everybody's lives when you do that so you can't just you can't just do it willy-nilly um but but it has to be meaningful enough and you know and you and and there are times when when you really do have to let people know that you're not going to be bullied right um and uh you know there's a lot of testing there are a lot of people poking you to see you know to to see how much you'll take and uh you know i'll be poked and prodded to a certain degree, and I will especially be poked and prodded by people who are smarter and better at their jobs than I am, but not someone who's not. <laughs> right. <laughs> not the guy who shows up and gets back on his private jet. And yeah, exactly. Hilton Head. Yep. So Falling Water is on USA, which is doing uh, some really great shows. Mr. Robot. I mean, yes. they really, USA really turned it around. Yep. They really turned it around from uh, the Silk Stockings Network. Yeah, and and as we call it, <laughs> blue sky shows. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it's always there's it's all you're outdoors. There's a jet Everyone's ski in the background. Looking. Everyone's good looking, and they're in pastels. And they're all white. Yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. It's they've really, really changed and, and turned it around. Yeah, and you know, in our show, we've got three leads. Um, um, David Ajala is a fantastic black actor from the UK. Will Yun Lee, fantastic Korean American actor, and Lizzie Brochere, who's French. So a real multinational, multi ethnic cast. So when does it, it it's is it's falling water in October? October thirteenth, ten o'clock, USA network. Fantastic. Uh I'm so glad that you came to we did this in my house. We're in my house. Um, cause today I wasn't at the studio today and I, and, and it's just, it's so much warmer. It's like, it's a nicer environment here. The studio, the studio is fine, but it's just nice. You know, when someone can come to your house and sit on a couch and not feel like, Oh, I, yeah, I felt like we were just chatting, we're just chatting. We just yeah. happen to be holding microphones, <laughs> but then we get to hang out again. As one does. As one does. Yeah. I mean this, this, the wife and I all the time just sit around <laughs> with microphones. What do you think? What should you do for dinner? Well, I don't know. What do you want to do? Well, I don't know. Um, and I know that my, you know, so often my mom says like, if you see Gail, tell her, you know, I'll take her to lunch anytime. Okay. Well, Pasadena. when I am back, when I am back from New York. Excellent. She has got a date. Good. Gail and Hurd, thank you for being here. Uh, congratulations on everything. And, uh, it's really an honor to sit and chat with you about this stuff. I mean, this is all, you know, just being a child of pop culture, and exactly the right age for all of those things, you know, it's a really big deal. I mean, you've, you've made such an impact for so many people just through entertainment value and then also inspired people to want to, you know, be the next you or the next Jim Cameron or the next, you know. So I hope you I, – I, I know you say, like, uh, it's all part of a day's work, but I hope sometimes – you do kind of emotionally reward yourself and go, hey, I've actually, I think I've done a pretty good job at this point. I think maybe I've done some good stuff. You know, um, I, I, what, what's, what keeps me going is what I get to do next. And that's the 14-year-old in me, is that I love what I'm doing. I wouldn't be doing it otherwise. Um, and I'm always excited to see what's going to come next. Excellent. Enjoy your burrito, everyone. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito.